Friday, everyone. Welcome to the Daily Briefing. I have a few things to do at the top, and then I'm happy to open it up. First, as I'm sure uh, many of you, if not all of you, saw today, the Nobel Committee uh, recognized today the vision and efforts of the Organization for the Prohibition of Chemical Weapons with the award of the Nobel Peace Prize. The extraordinary work of the OPCW began more than 15 years ago after a 100-year effort to ban chemical weapons succeeded with the entry into force of the Chemical Weapons Convention in 1997. The OPCW has been instrumental in verifying the elimination of chemical weapons around the world. Member states of the OPCW now represent 98 percent of the global population and land mass. The OPCW is the guardian of the global ban on chemical weapons and implements humanity's collective judgment that the use of chemical weapons by anyone at any time runs against the very conscience of mankind. As a repository of international expertise on chemical weapons, the OPCW constitutes a unique resource and an invaluable tool to address the threat of chemical weapons. The award of the Nobel Peace Prize today to the OPCW no doubt reflects the critical role uh, that they are playing in the Syrian CW crisis. As people know, in March of this year, the OPCW was called upon by the UN Secretary General to support a UN investigation into allegations of CW use in Syria. A UN team staffed by OPCW chemical weapons experts investigated the August 21st attack and confirmed, utilizing OPCW designated laboratories, that sarin was used to kill over 1,000 Syrians. So I just want to take another opportunity to congratulate the OPCW uh, on the uh, awarding of the Nobel Peace Prize, uh, reiterate that they're dedicated to a vision of a world free of chemical weapons through the verifiable elimination of existing stockpiles and the prevention of the reemergence of chemical weapons. And uh, that's exactly what they're working so hard uh, to do today in Syria. So that's first. And then second, I just have a quick travel update. You probably saw the secretary, the notice that went out this morning about the secretary's travel. Uh, he is right now in Kabul, Afghanistan. Uh, he will be meeting with President Karzai uh, this evening. Uh, we're going to be talking about how to make progress, have discussions about uh, the BSA, also about preparation for the elections. Uh, and that's happening all right now, so I'm sure we'll have a readout after that happens. Uh, tomorrow, he will be in, uh, in Paris to have dinner with Saudi Foreign Minister Saud al-Faisal. They will be talking about a range of issues. And then Monday, we'll be meeting in London with Mr. Brahimi uh, to discuss a, discuss a range of issues, including, of course, Syria. With that, Deb, let's go ahead and get Can us started. When he's coming Arshan, home? I'm going I'm to let Deb start, yeah. and then I'll go to you. Mm -hmm. Just real quick, if we could get this out of the way real quick. Mm -hmm. Is there any, is the government shutdown affecting the Keystone Pipeline um, Environmental Review? I'll get to Keystone in one second. Did you just have a logistical question, Arshad? I did. But you okay. I'll start with Deb, so you no, do no, that. No, no. Go for it. No, you, you go ahead and ask Deb your question. Okay. Go right ahead. Okay. Okay, we'll move on from travel. Keystone, yes, thank you. Uh, the State Department continues to carry out its work to finalize the Supplementary Environmental Impact Statement. As folks know, finalizing the draft SEIS involves work with consulting agencies to discuss and address their comments as appropriate. Uh, most of these consulting agencies have had a large number of staff furloughed uh, during this process, which has made it harder to work on with them. Uh, we obviously need information, technical expertise that these agencies can provide, and it's just making it more difficult right now. We, don't have, we haven't had an, an estimate on timing uh, ever throughout this process, so I, I, it's, obviously we can't make any predictions now, but it certainly has made it harder. Sense before the shutdown of when you had wanted to make this decision, by because no. we expected there to be some decision over the summer, and then that didn't happen. So, I mean, it might ho be holding up, um, you know, kind of discussions, but it wasn't really holding up like a, a pending decision because that wasn't eminent. Is that well, right? yeah, we never had a timeline. We never put anything out in terms of expectations. It's just making it harder to work on right now. I'm pretty yeah. Sure actually at the time um, said that they thought, I uh, could be mistaken, mm -hmm. but I'm quite certain that U.S. officials said at the time that they thought that the review could be completed <clears throat> as early as the first quarter. Um, I may be wrong about that, but there was a timeline that was discussed. It was briefed, uh, um, and I'll go back and check. Yeah, let, let's go back and check on that. It's my understanding that we never put forward a timeline for when the uh, final SEIS would be done. That's my understanding that we've never put a timing on that. Quarter of the year that this I, it was, again, it was, this was a review and it was calendar year. So maybe let's, it's let's, different. Maybe we're talking about different things. We might here be also. talking about different things. Let's go back and double check. I know for the whole process we haven't put a timeline right. on it, um, and there's no update on decision. that. Anything okay. else on the shutdown? Uh, no, nothing else today. Okay. In terms, I'm going to go to Arshad next though. In terms of when he's coming back, 
Uh, I don't have any, you know, his meeting is Monday, uh, uh, or excuse me, let's see, Monday, Sunday in London. I'm trying to figure, look at my notes here in terms of when this is. The Brahimi meeting, I believe, is Monday in London, if I'm reading this correctly, so they should be back late after that, but I just don't know exactly when. And hopefully we will have a briefing on Tuesday. I just wa I wondered why it was um, the secretary felt it was necessary to add these two stops on. I mean, obviously, mm -hmm. meeting the Saudi foreign minister, meeting um, you know the Syrian envoy are important things. Very but, important. Mm -hmm. But he's also been on the road for quite some time now. He and has I just been. <laughs> wondered what was the urgency of actually a face-to-face -face meeting, something that couldn't be done via a phone call or even Skype, for, well, for instance. I like the uh, you, Skype, Skype, Skype idea. <laughs> I'll, I'll tell the secretary I think we should do that. No, he obviously believes, we talk on the phone all the time, but sometimes it's important to meet face-to-face. -face. Obviously, there's incredible urgency to get towards the Geneva II conference, which is a major topic of conversation with a Special Representative Brahimi. Um, and obviously, Sadov Faisal discussion will cover a range of pressing issues as well that we've talked about. Has so, he spoken to the foreign, uh, Saudi uh, foreign minister in the last couple of days since the U.S. announced its decision on Egypt. I, be it because I will double check. Consultations. I will double check. I believe he has, but let me double check on that. Really? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Is his visit to Paris especially to meet with the Saudi Faisal? That's my understanding. That's yes. the, the, the mm -hmm. only purpose. Uh, it's, that's my understanding that that's the purpose. I don't know if other meetings will get tacked on. But how how do purpose. you characterize relations with the Saudis now? Are you with, are you on the same page with them regarding Egypt, Syria, and Iran? Well, look, we and the Saudis have a very close working uh, partnership on all of these issues. We talk about them constantly with them, and we share the goals of preventing Iran from acquiring a nuclear weapon. Uh, we certainly uh, share the goals of getting uh, Syria back to a stable and secure place. So we're going to keep talking to them about these issues, and I'm certain they will have a productive meeting uh, when they get together in Paris. But this is the, the mm -hmm. third or fourth meeting between uh, Secretary Kerry and They've met and quite South a bit. Mm -hmm. in, in four weeks, what's the purpose of all these meetings. There's been a lot going on in the last four weeks. But, but not, not with other uh, for, uh, Arab foreign ministers. Well, he's met, he's met with a range of, of folks, including during his trip to Asia. Not four, three or four times. Uh, I'll double check month. and see if he's actually met with Sadov Faisal that many times yeah, he recently. Met, he met with him in uh, Paris check. and uh, New York, and this is the third, I think. I'll double check on the timing. But he's met, I mean, we had Unga. He's been on the road a lot. There have been, quite frankly, a lot of bilateral meetings with a lot of folks over the past few weeks. to determine whether something has had, like, whether, no. you know, these meetings weren't scheduled when this trip was first kind of... Hatched. Well, we hadn't announced them publicly. That's true. So just wondering if, um, for instance, the Saudis have called a meeting because of the decision on Egypt or if there's any developments. In I'll try to find out if this is in response to something. As we all know, they do meet quite frequently uh, to discuss these issues. I just, I just don't know. And I just wanted to mm -hmm. sit on this incredibly expanding tour of the secretaries. I know. Whether there's a plan, since we'll be getting close to the date, to swing by Geneva for the Iran talks. I know, I know. I, we keep guessing no, uh, about that um, to see if I'll see him in Geneva. Uh, no, there's no plan for him to go to Geneva at this point. Obviously, everything could change, but uh, Under Secretary Sherman will be leading our delegation. But when you, when you say, obviously, everything can change, you don't have any expectation. Correct. I do not. I have no expectation. Because I don't know if you saw today that there was just some comments out of Iran. I'm sorry, I'm forgetting who actually said it, mm -hmm. that they feel that the, the, these negotiations are so delicate that they should actually be le led by the foreign ministers. Obviously, Foreign Minister Zarif is the appointed um, head of the delegation, mm -hmm. but there was a suggestion... As lead negotiator. As lead negotiator, mm -hmm. yes. But there was um, a suggestion that perhaps on, on all the other side of the P5 plus one, that the negotiations should be led by the foreign minister. Well, when it's appropriate for them to happen at that level, we're certainly open to that. Obviously, at the UN... Uh, that's the level we all sat down together and, and discussed. Uh, so I think it's important to get all the political directors around the table to uh, wait uh, for the Iranians to come, uh, hopefully with a substantive response to our plan. And then when it needs to be taken to a, a different level, we'll do so. Yeah, mm -hmm. Can we go to the OPCW, uh, Nobel Prize winning? The Syrians yes. are taking credit, actually, for this. Do you concur? That the fact that they facilitated their work and they made them prominent and the, they the made... The Syrian regime so, is taking yes, credit yes, for yes. this? Yeah, the Syrian government is taking hmm. credit. They're saying that our cooperation has made this possible. Do you agree? No. I don't, wouldn't put the Syrian regime in any sentence with the word peace okay. or the Nobel Peace Prize in any way, shape, or form, Saeed. Uh, what we've said, and I think what the OPCW and the UN uh, have been the ones on the front lines leading this effort to start destroying parts of uh, the program and that we'll be doing the tough work going forward, obviously, in conjunction with a lot of international partners. 
We said the Syrian regime has responsibilities. We expect them to comply with those. But uh, the OPCW has, I think as you saw the Secretary say this morning, taken unprecedented steps, worked with unprecedented speed to confront a situation they've quite frankly never confronted in their history. But you'd certainly agree that the Syrians so far, so far have been quite cooperative and things have gone very smoothly. Correct? So the Syrian regime thus far right. has uh, met some of its responsibilities that it is uh, be beholden to under the Security Council resolution. So they have met only some of their responsibilities and not all the responsibilities? Well, they haven't far. had an opportunity to meet all of their responsibilities yet. Their full declaration isn't due until October 27th. We've certainly seen progress. Uh, the OPCW has, has had um, some success up until this point, starting to destroy some of the stockpiles. But uh, let's be clear that the Syrian regime has obligations, it has responsibilities, and it must be in compliance with the uh, Security Council resolution. Okay. We fully expect them to live up uh, to those responsibilities. Okay, just a quick follow-up. Do you, do you believe now that this actually gives added protection to the inspectors on the ground, the fact that they are international heroes and their harm, you know, may, may create a lot of... Uh, Problems well, I think with or without a Nobel right. Peace Prize, I right. think that it goes without saying that uh, the Syrian regime has a responsibility to protect the safety of everybody right. uh, as part of this effort on the ground. I don't think this should, I, th I think that should have been the case before it, quite okay, frankly. But, uh, you're saying the Syrian regime, do you also expect that in areas where it is under the control of the opposition, the, military, the militant opposition, mm -hmm. that they should be held responsible as well? Uh, absolutely. For protection? Absolutely. We've underscored the opposition uh, repeatedly that they need to that they need to also provide this. In the past, they've talked about this when we talked about the UN team. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, Marie, does Secretary Kerry? Um, I know you read the statement, but in terms of the OPCW getting mm -hmm. this award, certainly there's um, the Nobel Peace Prize. Certainly, there's a lot more attention on them because mm -hmm. of this mission in um, Syria. Absolutely, and it all kind of came about um, after the secretary kind of proposed this proposed this idea in the first place. So I'm wondering if he feels um, any particular um, pride or anything in, or responsibility in terms of them getting the award. No, n not at all. I think you saw his statement this morning. I mean, look, he put on the table an idea. It's one we'd been talking about and thinking about internally. Uh, but after that, we, there was a lot of hard work required from, quite frankly, a lot of different parties. And, and where we are today, uh, is that the Syrian regime is operating under, has responsibilities under both the UN Security Council resolution and the OPCW resolution, which also passed with unanimous consent. Uh, they're going to be the ones overseeing the implementation on the ground. So the way we get from A to B, from the secretary putting on the table an idea, and B being the destruction of the Syrian chemical weapons program, is there's a lots of implementation that still has to happen. This is going to be very dangerous. It's going to be very difficult. It's going to take some time. We're doing it as quickly as possible. But that's the, the work the OPCW is doing uh, is really unprecedented in, in any destruction effort and is, is what's responsible for them getting this award today. They're taking steps they've never had to take before because the situation is so dire. And, they, and the member states of the Executive Council unanimously consenting to the resolution, and then the, the OPCW technical experts on the ground, they're doing the hard work out there on the front lines right now as we speak. It's true, but a lot of events have happened as a result of these kind of off-the-cuff remarks of absolutely. the secretaries, wouldn't you say? Well, absolutely. We've said that, what, three or four weeks ago, no one could have even imagined that we, we, we would be at this place today, where uh, the Syrian regime finally admitted they had chemical weapons, where they acceded to the CWC. Uh, where the OPCW and the UN had folks on the ground in Syria starting to destroy some of this stockpile. Uh, absolutely. And there have been a lot of people involved in this, and there will be a lot of people involved in it going forward. Mary, can I just ask, with, Hayden? Do you agree with uh, characterization that the comments were off the cuff? Uh, no, I think we've talked about this sort of ad nauseum. What I we've know. said is he was responding to a question uh, with uh, something we'd been sort of talking about internally, right? Uh, an idea about getting Syria to admit to and then destroy their chemical weapons and put it on the table as a challenge, right? I mean, he, sir he said at the time also, look, they could hand them all over within one week. It was uh, an off-the-cuff remark based on conversations we've been having internally. So I, I think that, uh, you know, then uh, other folks picked up the ball and ran with it and we had an obligation to see where it would go and we are where we are today. Yes. Yes. Can I ask the, that hidden among all the plaudits for the OPCW, there mm -hmm. was also some criticism of the United States and Russia by the Nobel jury, which uh, said that neither United States or Russia have actually fulfilled their obligations under the, conventional, uh, the Treaty on, the on Chemical 
Chemical Weapons Treaty. Conven convention. Sorry. Mm -hmm. The CWC. <laughs> yeah. yeah. To uh, get rid of all their chemical weapons stock by April 2012. Mm -hmm. Would you respond to, to that, please? I'll check on the latest on that. I do know that, that we and the Russians have w both worked very hard together to destroy uh, our existing stockpiles. I'll get the latest on where that stands. It's a lengthy process, obviously, but I'll get the latest for you, and I, I can actually take that as a question and see what I can do. I know exactly yeah. what the held up has been and how far along how, I'm not sure if there's been a specific hold up. I think it's just a process that we've worked with the Russians that takes time. We've both worked on it. L let me just see what okay. I can get for you Thank on you. that. Uh -huh. with working with the Russians, do you believe that the, the tension that was there before the announcement by the secretary or the, the remark of the cup or otherwise, mm -hmm. uh, the, that uh, the tension has been mitigated to the point where you can actually now see eye to eye on the interpretation of, let's say, Geneva 1 on the, on the move forward. The, the tension with the Russians? Yes. Over what issue specifically? Over Syria. And we're talking about Syria. I mean, okay. About, in well, this context, I mean, you know. We've always said a couple things about our relationship with Russia when it comes to Syria. The first is that we both agreed to the Geneva communique. Right. We both agreed that there needs to be a transitional government based on mutual consent by the different sides. We both agreed that needs to happen as soon as possible, and hopefully that'll be the case. Uh, we've also made it clear when we disagree with actions the Russian government has taken in terms of supporting the regime. But I think it's important to focus right now on the fact that uh, the Russians have the uh, opportunity and indeed have been helping uh, to push the Syrian regime to continue cooperating and uh, complying, I should say, excuse me, not cooperating, but complying with their obligations. Why can't you say cooperating? They're cooperating and they're meeting their responsibilities. Because I'm going to use a more technical term, and that's complying. We're going to use technical terms when we're talking about technical issues here. But going back to Saeed's question, uh, look, we've also said that this is an opportunity, uh, because we have been able to work together on CW, to make progress on Geneva too. And that's what we are hoping will be coming as soon as possible, uh, and we'll continue telling them when we disagree with things they're doing. Yeah, I still don't understand the, th the rationale that um, progress on the destruction of chemical weapons could lead to progress on Geneva II for the very simple reason that ever since this agreement on chemical weapons, um, the Syrian regime has basically said that this is a, you know, a license for job security. We need to implement this agreement. We're not going anywhere. President Assad is staying. In fact, since the agreement, the regime has only dug in its heels. Well, and since the agreement, we've been clear that that's just not the case. I understand, and that our position but you're hasn't not changed. a part, you're, you may be helping mediate these talks, but you're not a party to the talks. And so if one of the parties is, in fact, digging in its heels and less prone to negotiation along the lines of what you'd like to see, um, and certainly the, what they're saying is a non-starter for the opposition, how does that make progress more likely? In fact, it makes it look like it's less likely. Well, actually, we are a party to the discussions, right? We are, we and the Russians and the You're UN. You're hosting them, right? Correct. The three of us, the three, those three parties are working together to determine date, uh, participation. Those conversations are ongoing. We each are working with the folks that we talk to in the opposition, obviously, on our side, the Russians with the regime, to determine who will actually sit at the table when we eventually do get to Geneva, too. So we certainly have a role to play. And the fact that it's the UN and the Russians who are working with on Geneva, too, the exact same people we were able to negotiate a groundbreaking agreement with, actually, I do think could have a positive impact on it. When you're willing to sit down and work with someone on one thing, inevitably, it that, means it's easier to I'm work on something else. I'm not saying that the three of you wouldn't work um, better together. But the situation that has resulted um, with this agreement is that the uh, regime feels that this is, uh, you know, gives them job security, and the opposition feels that they are, you know, less, less of a strong partner at the table. So how does that make it how does that make progress more likely? Well, I think what we've said is that we're going to keep talking to the opposition about the fact that our position has not changed on the future of Assad. Uh, our position hasn't changed, that he has no legitimacy and must go. We've made that perfectly clear. Privately and publicly to the opposition, we will continue doing so. I understand, but it doesn't really, mm -hmm. I mean, I understand your position hasn't changed, mm -hmm. but, and I understand that you're also, you say you're a party to the agreement, but at the end of the day, and you've said yourself that it's going to be the Syrians' decision. And so, again, if if the regime's position has changed in the sense that it's even less likely um, to negotiate an exit to Assad after this agreement, how does that help? Well, I think what we're focused on, Elise, is working with the Russians and the UN for all of us to bring our parties to the table. And that's why you have a conference, right, to work out all of these issues. 
And uh, that's what we're focused on right now. It's difficult, obviously. If it weren't, it would have happened months ago. And uh, I, I think that's, that's why you saw Secretary Kerry talking to Foreign Minister Lavrov uh, when he was uh, in his, part of his Asia trip. And, and we'll be meeting with Mr. Brahimi and talking to them throughout this process. So hopefully we can get to a conference as soon as possible. But yeah. You and the Russians are in disagreement regarding the interpretation of uh, Geneva 1 communique. How can you or how you are pressing the, the Syrian opposition to attend Geneva 2 and you are in disagreement with, uh, with Moscow? Well, we're continuing the discussions with Moscow, but also with the opposition, right? And saying uh, that they need to continue coalescing. We need to figure out who's going to represent them at the table, specifically. And that that's why you have a conference. You, you get everyone around a table who agrees on a framework. In this case, that's the Geneva communique. And you go uh, to the conference to hash out what that means in practice and all those details. But, every, but let's be clear, in order to participate in the conference, you have to fully embrace uh, and sign on to the Geneva One communique. Everybody who participates must do so. But you are in disagreement with the Russians. I think that's that a pretty broad statement. I think there's a lot in the Geneva uh, communique that we absolutely agree on. I think that's a very broad statement and a, a bit of a mischaracterization. One, one more thing. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov has uh, said today that there are reports that some third countries are training Syrian rebels to use chemical weapons in uh, Afghanistan. Do you have any Wow, a lot came together in that question. About this? I haven't seen those comments. I'm happy to take a look and get back to you. I just haven't seen them. Joe? Corey, what is the biggest factor right now keeping the opposition from getting together and uh, you know, having representation at Geneva too? Well, I, they've made a lot of progress to be clear in this area and and we've talked about some of it in this room. What is the biggest thing because it's not happening. Well, some of it's happening. It's not a zero-sum game, right? They're getting more organized, uh, but we have to figure out who will best represent them. There's a lot of different groups and parts of it. We've been clear who we recognize, but we're trying to work to get them uh, to, to a good place uh, in terms of participation and, and invitations. But, this but th that's actually me. not the trickiest invita invitation question, right, if we're looking at right. who will come to Geneva. Right, there but are I mean, other tricky we've, questions. We've, we've, been we've talked about this. other countries that could possibly attend. We've talked about Iran a little bit in this room. Uh, and others. But we've been hearing the, really the same thing for a long time, mm -hmm. before you even started in your job. It's hard this to remember that day, I know, it's yo, know. you know, many years ago, mm -hmm. but uh, <laughs> it's, it's seriously, I mean, this is what's been said for so long, it seems almost ridiculous at this point that um, we're trying to help them get their act together, they are coalescing, we're, they we're, are, is, yeah. is, it, is, it, is it possible at this point that they can do that? Absolutely. Absolutely, and, and Robert Ford met, just met with um, folks over the weekend in Istanbul, mm -hmm. uh, as we said, and they have actually made quite a bit of progress. I mean, the election of leaders, uh, the SMC and the Syrian coalition, they actually, I don't think we're as far away from, from uh, getting them uh, to the table with representation a, as we certainly are with some other groups. I think, I think we've actually made some progress and, and are hoping to get this all finalized as soon as possible. Uh, on this very point, mm -hmm. I mean, you know, on the opposition, yeah. I mean, you agree that it has so many hits, you know, on, so, uh, whether it's uh, in the field, uh, fighting and so on, mm -hmm. but also politically. And now Jarba last week made it very clear they will only meet with Assad as an enemy. They will only meet if their conditions are met and so on. So does that complicate Ambassador Ford's effort? Uh, I think uh, what we've been clear about in terms of getting to a Geneva 2 is that the precondition is everybody has to accept Geneva 1. Okay. What that looks like, all those details right now, Saeed, are, are being worked out with the opposition, with the Russians, with the UN, with the host of parties that could be uh, part of this conference. Those details are all being worked out right now. Okay, so, so uh, as you know, in this process, uh, would Ambassador Ford say to Jarba that by making these statements, you're actually complicating the, the, the road ahead toward Geneva? I'm not going to read out the conversations Ambassador Ford is having specifically with the opposition. Uh, he's in close contact with them uh, all the time. And his goal is, is what our, all of our goal is, to, to reassure them, to tell them that our position on Assad has not changed, that we are working as quickly as possible to get to Geneva II, and we will do everything uh, in our power to continue uh, to get everyone to the table and to support the opposition as they fight the regime. I want to ask mm -hmm. um, one more question. Yeah. Who is, when you say that we're having discussions with a host of parties mm -hmm. involved, who is the party that's having the discussions with Iranians about getting them to accept Geneva 1? Uh, I don't know the answer to that question. It's not us, but I... Not, I would, not the United States. To my knowledge, no, but let me see if I can find out. Uh, I, we've also certainly said it publicly. Is that something um, that perhaps Wendy Sherman, if she has a side meeting with Foreign Minister Zarif, would 
take up? I, I, I don't I don't know, honestly. Uh, the latest reports coming from uh, Damascus uh, said that uh, the regime forces uh, have made uh, progress and they captured two villages in the suburbs and killed more than 100 uh, people. And the uh, Human Rights Watch uh, has criticized the, the Syrian opposition and saying or claiming that uh, they uh, committed a crime against the humanity by killing more than 100 Alawites in the, on the coast. Do you have any, anything on this? I do, uh, and I saw the Human Rights Report. Uh, obviously, we're deeply disturbed by the findings presented in it. Uh, as you noted, it documents serious abuses committed by some opposition groups doing, during their early August attempt uh, to liberate a, a, a piece of territory from regime control. Uh, we're reviewing the port, and we take its allegations seriously. Uh, I would note that according to Human Rights uh, Watch, that at least 20 distinct armed opposition groups participated in the operation, which lasted from August 4th through 18th. Uh, they have evidence linking five groups assessed to be key fundraisers, organizers, planners, and executors of the attacks to specific incidents that they say amount to war crimes. Uh, these are some of the groups we've talked about in the past, al-Nusra, ISIS. Um, some of the uh, more extreme groups that we don't recognize as legitimate opposition groups. Obviously, this violence against civilians is completely unacceptable, no matter who perpetrates it, and we would condemn this in any other attacks on civilians. And what about the uh, progress that the regime mm -hmm. is making? Uh, in I, I see some of those reports. I think every day we see different reports about what's happening on the ground. We would note that the uh, situation, you know, the lines of control or sort of the overall situation in terms of territories controlled hasn't uh, changed demonstrably, but every day we see sort of this back and forth going on on the ground. Mm -hmm. I'll raise this question. Uh, the same uh, report also put some blame on Turkey for this uh, uh, jihadist or uh, fighters uh, for that operation. Do you have any information or confirmation on that? I don't. You were uh, asked here a couple days ago about the situation in the south and uh, east suburbs of Ghouta and how they are uh, uh, encircled by the Assad regime mm -hmm. and how they have been starving for, mm -hmm. for months. Uh, do you think do you have any kind of communication channel or have you uh, communicated with the Assad regime uh, on those civilians that under the... Well, we certainly don't, as I said a few days ago, don't work with the Assad regime to get humanitarian, directly to get humanitarian assistance into places that need it. We will work with uh, other parties that do work with the regime because our goal is to get as much access in as possible. And we've certainly publicly called uh, on the regime uh, to allow humanitarian access in. As you said, you know, this is a terrible humanitarian situation. Every day it gets worse. Uh, winter is coming all too soon, and it will only get worse then. So we'll keep working with our partners to see if we can get some more uh, humanitarian access in. But quite frankly, the humanitarian situation is very dire today. And about the upcoming winter you just mentioned, do mm -hmm. you have any specific strategy to handle uh, the situation that expected to be much worse than last year in terms of refugees or... I can see if we have any updates. Obviously, it's an issue we remain quite uh, heavily engaged on. I'll see if there's anything uh, we have in terms of the next few months in, in strategy-wise. I just have one more. Sorry. One more, and then we'll move to Iran, Arshad. Um, they think yeah. the Human Rights Report kind of indicates that the lines of war are kind of blurred mm -hmm. over there, you know, with the different rebel groups and which ones are Western-backed. But there's also another thing that seems to be going on, and, and it was recently reported that the Syrian regime actually bombed the rebels in an area where they had some chemical weapons based and they wanted to take control of that. Are there going to be other sites that are, you know, chemical weapons sites that are held by the rebels or in rebel territory that we're going to see this again? Because it seems like we're cross purposes here. I can try and try and find out. Okay. I, I don't know the answer to that. I can try and find out. Yeah, Iran. One, just one on Iran. Mm -hmm. um, uh, in New York, you had made clear uh, and I think Under Secretary Sherman may have said in her testimony the other day that you would welcome an Iranian proposal in advance of the talks. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think on Wednesday you said that you had not received one yet. Mm -hmm. Have you received one to date? Not to my knowledge, no. Okay. Can you check and let us know? Because mm -hmm. it's important to know whether you got one or not. Mm -hmm. I, I don't believe we did, but I will triple check. Thank you. Are you getting conflicting Israeli statements on the situation in Iran? On the one hand, we have the Prime Minister uh, warning that, you know, uh, danger is imminent, it's almost there. 
And on the other hand, there are Israelis in this town, officials that are saying basically that the sanctions are working and the United States is basically conducting the proper policy. Are you getting conflicting messages? No, I think uh, we obviously talk to the Israelis uh, all the time about the Iranian nuclear threat. Right. Uh, we both agree uh, that words aren't enough. We need to see actions. Uh, we both agree that they can't be allowed to acquire a nuclear weapon and that, uh, you know, we we're going to continue working diplomatically with the P5 plus one to see if we can resolve this peacefully. Uh, we also both agree that the sanctions are the, the reason uh, that the Iranians indeed may be uh, using more conciliatory, conciliatory tones today. But what we're all focused on is seeing what they come with substantively. Okay, so you agree that the Iranian nuclear threat is imminent? And at I the didn't same say time, that. Okay, well, that's what, that's what the Prime Minister said. I didn't say that. Look, we and the Israelis both agree right. uh, that this is the highest national security priority, not just for the United States, but for Israel as well, uh, and for the region, not, not just Israel. And that that's why the President's been clear that we will not allow Iran to acquire a nuclear weapon, that all options remain on the table to do so. Uh, but I think it's also important to be clear here, uh, heading into next week when we'll be in Geneva, uh, that we have an obligation to try diplomacy, to try and resolve this peacefully, in part, uh, in large part, because the alternative has a lot of incredibly grave consequences that would go along with it. There's a reason for everybody's sake that a diplomatic resolution to the Iranian nuclear crisis would be preferable. All options, of course, remain on the table, but uh, the, so some of those options obviously have incredibly serious consequences, and we have an obligation to attempt to resolve it before we get there. I think that's an important point to keep in mind as we go into next week. Anything else? Yes. Can I go to Libya? Yeah. Um, I just wondered if um, yesterday you said you were trying to get some more details about what happened with the abduction of the Libyan Prime Minister. And I don't have anything new on that. Oh, well, he, he's come out today and said he believes it was a coup attempt. I, I saw some of those comments. I just, I don't have any more details on, on that for you. I'm, if, if we do, we can share them. Yes, Saeed? Uh, is, are you uh, alarmed enough to send in dispatch like troops or maybe a task force into the shores of Libya at the present time? Seeing that the government obviously cannot even provide its own safety. Well, the answer is no. <laughs> um, but I think what we're focused on is helping, uh, working with our partners in Libya to build their capability, their security capability, their counterterrorism capability. Um, and and we're, we're focused on building that bilaterally and, and helping them build up their own capacity. Yeah, but they're sliding towards chaos. I mean, today there was a bombing of the Swedish embassy or consulate and so on. So it's happening every day. You know, why, why not, let's say, aid the Libyans in, in basically providing better security? Well, we are Iran. assisting them in helping to shore up their stability and their security, just not in the way that you mentioned. Mm -hmm. uh, and, of course, we would condemn the attack on the Swedish uh, facility in Benghazi today. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's exactly why we believe it's so important to continue working with the government to help them improve their own internal security. How are you shoring up their capability? Well, we've, there have been a number of different things we've done uh, in terms of assistance and advice and uh, sort of the broad range of bilateral ways we work together on counterterrorism and security. If I have more specifics, I'm happy to get those for you. I just don't have them in front of me. Mm -hmm. uh, sorry, can I change the topic yeah. again? Mm -hmm. North Korea this time. Mm -hmm. There's a report out that Kenneth Bai's mother has gone to visit him. Yes. I wondered if you're aware of that and how that came about and mm -hmm. what your general comment on it is. So we are aware. We uh, remain, of course, in close contact with Mr. Bay's family. Uh, we remain gravely concerned about his health and continue to urge the DPRK authorities to grant him special amnesty and immediate release on humanitarian grounds. Uh, Let's see. The U.S. government did not arrange Mrs. Bay's private trip. We helped her coordinate her trip with the Embassy of Sweden in Pyongyang, which is our protecting power there. Uh, the Embassy of Sweden regularly seeks consular access to him, and they've met with him eight times since his detention, most recently just on October 11th. Today. Today. Yep. So I understand you didn't arrange the trip, mm -hmm. but you are in touch with the Swedes in terms of the consular access. So. How did uh, this recent uh, visit with Mr. With so Mr. Vega? basically all we did was uh, helped her coordinate her trip with the embassy I'm not there. even asking about her. I'm just asking. Oh. You said that there was a consular visit. Oh, the I consular visit. I, excuse me. I thought you were yeah. asking about the Do trip. Do you have a readout of that? I How? don't. I don't. If we have one, I'm happy to share. I just don't have it. Mm -hmm. I just want to go back to Libya for a second. Mm -hmm. Now, there are a group of defense lawyers in this country that are saying that you are violating the right, the human right and the legal right of Abu Anas in Libya by holding him at sea and no, nobody knows where and so on, and that the proper thing to do is really to bring him to American soil where he can be charged 
properly and try it properly. Do well, you have any comment on that? We've been clear that under both U.S. and international law, he's being held lawfully by the United States military. I don't have an update on what his eventual disposition will be, but uh, that's certainly our position, and uh, I, I don't have any other further comment in terms of that. And how can the, the veracity of this claim that he's being held lawfully be made? Well, I can walk through again the legal justification for it if you'd I'm like. I'm saying that how could you convince you know, an inquiring world that in fact he's being held lawfully? Well, because under both international law and under United States law, uh, we are acting in accordance with both. Those outline uh, the legal justification both for the operation uh, to capture him and also the legal justification uh, for his detention uh, right now and uh, the humane treatment that he is receiving uh, as well. You, um, I'm sorry if you asked this and I missed it, uh, Said, but um, have you yet arranged consular access? I don't have any update for you on consular access. And has the ICRC yet been allowed to see him? I don't have any update for you on that either. Um, and do you concede the point that your assertions that he's been treated humanely would be buttressed if there were independent observers like the RCRC who were able to talk to him and, and confirm that? Well, I think we've said uh, that when it's appropriate, we'll uh, comply with our you know, obligations to the ICRC and also with consular access. Uh, but I think we've been very clear uh, the rules governing his detention and interrogation right now. And uh, those have been spelled out since the beginning of the administration and uh, have been very crystal clear. There is the, the reason I keep asking this, though, and I've, I've raised it three or four days in a row, is that, and this is not a, at all a commentary on the current administration mm -hmm. in any way, but you're up there speaking for the United States of America. Absolutely. And in at least two highly public instances in the last decade, right, one, the, you know, waterboarding and so on, mm -hmm. which has been well detailed, and two, mm -hmm. Abu Ghraib, uh, the United States government has not humanely treated prisoners in its custody. And so when you have somebody like Mr. Alibi, whatever may be his alleged crimes mm -hmm. and the indictment against him and so on, and you hold him incommunicado and you assert that he's being treated humanely, mm -hmm. but you do not allow either his representatives of his government or of the international community in the form of the ICRC to visit him, it is it is understandable why people might be skeptical about the assertion of humane treatment. Well, I, I appreciate the question, Arshad, and I do know why it's important. And I think, uh, I know I keep going back to the executive order, but there's a reason I do so. Because in one of the first acts this president did when he came into office to underscore how important it was to him was on his second full day in office signing that executive order that said, we're not going to do things like we have been doing them. That we're the United States of America, we operate under certain principles, values, and that going forward, this will be the rules governing how we detain and interrogate people. And he very plainly laid that out when we talk about the Army Field Manual, when we talk about uh, uh, humane treatment. Uh, we tried to lay it out as specifically as we can. And he made that point very clearly that this is how it's going to operate in this administration. And that's exactly how it's operating right now. I take the point and as much evidence and, and you know insight into that as we can provide we're happy to, but uh, right now, uh, suffice to say, we're operating under the very clear guidance that this president laid out uh, when he very, uh, at the beginning, came into office. But, but why not provide an external, respected international body whose very job is to uh, inspect and check such things, including for American mm -hmm. soldiers, for example? Mm -hmm. Access. It would be a way to show that what you say is true. So why not do? What is the what is the under, underlying reason well, why? I'm not it saying hasn't we're not happened. going to. No, but it hasn't mm -hmm. happened so far, and and so there's a question in my mind. I think it's a reasonable question. Why mm -hmm. not do that? Well, there's a lot of uh, factors that play into this in terms of our obligations to both the ICRC and our consular obligations. I, I just don't have anything further for you on exactly what the timing is or what's underpinning that. Um, but as we have more to share on this, I'm, I'm happy to do so. But you're kind of almost asking, when you say that you know, this administration is operating under what the president said, you're asking the international community to just take your word for it. No, I'm asking the international community to, say that, to, to know that when we say we're a nation of laws 
And when we lay those out very clearly in an executive order, what's governing uh, very clearly and publicly in an executive order, talking about detention and interrogation, which let's be clear in the previous administration, we didn't talk about publicly, right, when these were first put into place, that that should be a sign that, that, it's, that business is going to be done differently now. And that's why we very yeah. publicly came out and said this is what we were going to be operating under. Are you aware of, or have you, or has the uh, Libyan government been in contact with his family to make sure that they are safe and not subject to any kind of threat? I would check in with the Libyan government on that. I okay. just don't know. I, guys, I, I need, I, yeah. so we need to move on just because I have a little bit of a schedule today, so let's get to some necessary stuff. Sorry, yes. I, I know yeah. it's... I mean, this, today is the, sec the end of the second week of the shutdown of the government, mm -hmm. and... Uh, as much as we, it was published today, it was less than 1% of State Department workforce of, of 70,000 people are furloughed. And more are expected in the, if it's prolonged. If we continue, we'll have to do additional furloughs, yes. Yes, and do you think that, because at the beginning of the week you blame somehow the Congress that they are not cooperating? Well, Congress has the ability to end the shutdown. Yes, yes. I'm mm -hmm. not arguing about this. Uh, do you okay. think that this is affecting your role in the, what you are doing in the diplomacy and uh, in, in the international arena or not? Well, I think just because I'm, we have a, only a limited amount of time today, I've spoken to, to this repeatedly since the shutdown started, uh, whether we talk about the image we're portraying to other countries that we don't have our own house in order here, whether the president couldn't go attend uh, some important summits and get some important business done. We've talked about how some of the financing might not be available. We've talked about some programs that aren't able to go forward. Uh, we've talked about a lot in this room. Uh, but I would say again what I said the other day, that we're strongest abroad when we're strong at home. And right now, we're not portraying the right image. And that's why we believe the shutdown needs to end. Yes, Joe. I have a specific question about that. Mm -hmm. Is um, public diplomacy considered um, essential? In other words, are they continuing to get their funds? And are they doing anything to assess what the international image of the United States or how it is doing or being affected by the well, shutdown? Well, I know folks are taking a look at that question. I don't know if there's an official uh, way we're looking at that, I know, but a lot of folks uh, in my office and others are looking at that question. Uh, we're not doing essential versus non-essential. Right now, uh, we're operating, uh, except for a few offices, uh, uh, thankfully, on, on funds that we still have. So we're not doing essential versus non-essential. Uh, we're not using those terms or making those decisions here at the State Department. Yet. When you say looking at it, you mean they're polling or Oh, what? no, no. I, I wouldn't say polling, but obviously monitoring. I, I've read some headlines over the last few weeks. Mm -hmm. uh, clearly, it's important how the U.S. is seen around the world, and quite frankly, the headlines about the shutdown are uh, pretty negative across the board. Absolutely. Okay. Yes, and I do need sight. I need very, to... Very quickly, okay. but we can probably Sorry. bring in next no. week. I usually stay up here for no, hours. No, I just I wanted to ask you a very quick question about uh, Ambassador Endic expanding his team. Could you share with us anything about expanding the team to include maybe twice as many people in it? I, I don't have any uh, staffing announcements we'll talk about it on Monday? Uh, we don't have a briefing on Monday. It's a holiday. Okay, it's Tuesday. All right. It's, it's Columbus, Columbus Day. Day. Uh, I can take the, if I have anything to share with you on staffing, I'm happy to. Yeah, two more and then. Yeah, quickly, yeah. Uh, may I uh, turn a pivot to Asia? Uh, is there any uh, meeting or visit to China being delayed or affected because of the shutdown? Uh, not by the secretary or by anyone else. And then Secretary Kerry, uh, when he met with the Philippine uh, Foreign Minister, mentioned mm -hmm. that he's going back to Asia Pacific in month. Can you give us some idea of what is that about? Yes, I, I know that he, he said that. We don't have um, any specifics on his future travel. He said he's looking forward to going back to the region soon. Yes, Alan. Really quick. Um, mm -hmm. There have been reports that the second in command of the Pakistani Taliban has been captured. Uh, Latif Mesud, just wondering if you have anything on that. I do. Thank you for the question. I can confirm that U.S. forces did capture TTP terrorist leader Latif Massoud in a military operation. I don't have further details to share about the operation for you at this time. Massoud is a senior commander in TTP and served as a trusted confidant of the group's leader, Haki Mullah Massoud. TTP claimed responsibility, as folks probably know, for the attempted bombing of Times Square in 2010 and has vowed to attack the U.S. homeland again. TTP is also responsible for attacking our diplomats in Pakistan and attacks that have killed countless Pakistani civilians. Was he captured on, the on Pakistani soil or on, in, on Afghan soil? I do not have further details about the operation at this okay. point. This, I just got this right before and, I came out. And do you know the date on which he was captured? Was it today? I do not know that answer. Uh, question. Last uh, question. Yeah, there are calls in the uh, Egyptian press uh, for the government to uh, cut or to refuse the American aids to, uh, to Egypt. 
do you have or do you expect uh, such a reaction from the government? And as I said, uh, Secretary Hagel had a very good conversation with General Sisi when they discussed the outcome of our policy review. We both agreed that we have. Uh, uh, it's, it's important for the two countries to continue working together. That's why we're continuing our relationship, and uh, that's what we're focused on right now, uh, working with them to do just that. Not to my knowledge, no. Thank you. I'm sorry, guys.